But today we're in our Mixed Reality studio to get the big picture on quantum computing. So how does this type of computing work and why it's so different from what we have today? So Jerry, first, right off the bat, let's break down the difference between a binary bit, which is in classical computing, and a qubit, which is in quantum computing. In classical com computing, when we use bits, they can really be only in one of two states. They can be either zero or can, they can be one. In this mm -hmm. case, they're either the blue or they're yellow. Right. But in the case of quantum bits or qubits, uh, you follow the laws of quantum mechanics, and what that lets you do is actually make information live in a superposition. Hmm. So you can actually be in states of zero and one at the same time, and actually live on anywhere on the surface of this sphere that you're looking at right now. You can exist anywhere within that. Yeah, that's correct. And what's really w crazy about it is that when you actually measure these qubits, even though you can be in all these states, at the end it still decides, am I zero or am I one? So you still go back to that bit representation at the end. So entanglement is actually another special type of superposition. And it's something that you never see in classical computing. It actually involves two qubits that then become perfectly correlated with one another. Gotcha. And so if you were to measure one qubit, you know exactly the state of the other qubit. So they're always mirroring each other they're always mirroring each other, and what's more is that if you wanted to just look at one on its own, it's random, you lost its information. So it, the power is in the fact that they are entangled and correlated. So now that we know how superposition and entanglement work with qubits, how does that help us moving forward with quantum computing? How does it give us some abilities that we don't have right now with classical computers? Yeah, so what's really interesting is that there are problems out there, like understanding molecules, uh, gotcha. which are very, very difficult for regular computers. But the thing is, in this molecule, what we're looking at here, this is actually the caffeine molecule, which we know and love in our coffee, <laughs> uh, there are a lot of interactions between all the different electrons in this molecule. And those interactions follow those laws of quantum mechanics that we just heard about with qubits. In some sense, what we can do is use these qubits to mimic the behavior of this molecule and study some of those interactions of the underlying electrons. And gotcha. that we can't really do in a scalable way with reg regular traditional bits, zeros and ones. But what are the challenges that come with trying to make a quantum computer work? Yeah, so really one of the most challenging parts of building these quantum computers is actually getting these qubits physically to survive and last long. And so the systems that we build at IBM uh, they're based off of superconducting technology, and in order to have the quantum properties uh, unlock, we have to actually cool them down to extremely low temperatures. Mm -hmm. And so what we're looking at here is actually one of our dilution refrigerators, the insides of this dilution refrigerator, which we use, use to cool down these qubits down to 15 millikelvin, which is... So this is actually what it looks like, correct? This is actually what it looks like, about this size. In terms of what's going on inside of this, walk us through where these signals are going and, and where they reach to make the qubits actually act the way you want them to. Yeah, so actually I have, a, I have a qubit chip here, and the qubit chip actually goes and sits at the bottom of this dilution refrigerator. Gotcha. Uh, and the reason it sits there is because that's where the system is the coldest. That's okay. where it's about 15 millikelvin. So all of this infrastructure is really just to be able to get that chip as cool as it needs to be. It's both to get it as cool as it needs to be, but also to bring down signals to control the states of the qubits. So what you see in here, there's some wires. Yeah. And microwave signals get sent down these wires. Uh, and effectively they go to flip the states of the qubits, so when we actually program it, the qubits do what we want in an actual uh, quantum program. So Jerry, when we're thinking about the future, tell us a little bit about what quantum computing is going to look like and how we're going to see this type of computing unfold. For the longest time, I'd say we were in this period of, of understanding the underlying quantum science, trying to build these actual systems. And then just recently when we were able to start to release it to the cloud, that's when we transitioned into this phase where we want to get people ready for using quantum computers. Hopefully within five years or so that we're going to be able to find real problems which we can use quantum computers to have advantage over classical computers. Give us a couple examples of what kind of problems you're talking about in terms of what quantum computing can solve. Yeah, so the problems that we want to look at with quantum computers are ones which effectively have a very large space for exploration, and they're very difficult in terms of the number of variables you might have. So say 
those molecules that we talked about like caffeine and understanding molecular structure, that has implications for drug discovery or for discovering new materials. Also, there's a lot of work in looking at how quantum and AI can mesh together, thinking about neural networks in the growing space of, of, of characterization. That's some place where we see a lot of interest with, uh, with using quantum computing for things like financial modeling and optimization of, of, uh, of routes and logistics. I think what we're gonna see in the future with uh, quantum computers is it's not gonna go and replace your computers today. You're gonna have problems and you're gonna take those problems and break them down into parts that are done on a traditional classical computer. And then there are the parts that are really difficult and challenging that we're gonna try to run on the quantum processor. And those are the ones which really grow in size and are very difficult to handle. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.